I don't know whose idea it was to put all of us together on this panel. Uh, but, but we're going to work it out. Uh, so the kindergarten teacher in me wants to have everybody stand up and shake the sillies out, because I see some of y'all falling asleep. But we just going to get into it. Uh, let me first say uh, to the organizers, thank you for extending this invitation. I bring you greetings on behalf of the president, the first lady, and secretary, um, Arnie Duncan. Uh, the question was asked sort of what would we imagine when we think about the future? And for me, it's one in which we accept that in 20 years, uh, we should not come back into this room and have the same conversation. We should even be having a version of this conversation. Um, and so because uh, themes and topics are nice, uh, for me, what I think about is moving from repairing the breach um, to acknowledging the importance or being reminded of the importance of being not only my brother's keeper, but my sister's supporter too, to inherently appreciating and celebrating the fact that we are all our nation's keepers, right? That this is about um, a, a tying together the thread that has run through all of the discussions we've had today and acknowledging that this is community work, right? We often like to say that it takes a village. Uh, to Susan Taylor's point, not just any village, but a smart, committed, and capable village. Um, so we have to talk about uh, how we move from there. Um, so one, let me say this, um, and, and primarily, Trevi and I were just in Ohio, and I ended up saying on the panel that there are so many people, uh, many of whom are our friends, who get paid to predict the rain. Uh, and so for me, it's really important uh, that we stop talking about the things that we know aren't working in our community and highlight the assets, if only because the panel that happened before ours um, um, reminded us that often we focus on the negative to the deficit of ignoring the positive assets that are happening in our community. And so I want to remind you again that there is an inherent problem um, in accepting or perpetuating the fact that there is a crisis among black men. Um, and to that point, I want all of the scholars in the room to stand up. All of the black men that are in school, stand up. Uh, the point here again is that we are not problems to be solved, but we are to be celebrated. Again, uh, the point is that we are not problems to be solved, but we are uh, complicated people that need to be celebrated. Um, and so who am I and why am I standing in front of you? Uh, anybody who knows me knows that I am passionate about education. I fought God for as long as I could before accepting that uh, educators do God's work uh, and stopped in my tracks. And I now have the great pleasure of serving our president as the first ever director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans. I know it's a long title and I don't have a whole lot of time, but I say that because it's important. <laughs> Uh, because far too often when we talk about black kids in education, excellence is missing. Um, and with that in mind, I also want to acknowledge that there are some fellow Columbia uh, alums in the, in the audience. And we've been talking about networks and relationships. I see y'all. Uh, and so what we do with the initiative is focus on uh, three things. And this is relevant both to the work of the initiative and a separate initiative called My Brother's Keeper, which has also been lifted up today. And I'll talk about both. John Wilson, thank you for your affirmation and enduring and unyielding support. Um, and so one, we uh, focus on the importance of having this conversation. We are all privileged people who chose on a weekend to get up, get dressed, y'all look really nice, and have a conversation about this, right? But we're privileged people. What we're talking about is how it is that we connect with those who don't have the luxury of the time or the resources or the wherewithal to sit in this space. So one, we need to instigate these conversations as often as possible at our kitchen tables and in our community centers. The second thing we need to do is recognize that there are assets in our community. I get tired of people when they say, this, we don't know what works. We gotta do more research. No, we just need to do more period. And so we focus on highlighting individuals, programs, policies, and people that are doing things, that are either showing promise or have evidence of, of, of effectiveness. The third thing we're doing is highlighting resources and strengthening networks in local communities. So the White House Initiative has a partnership with Ebony Magazine, and we produce five summits around um, the country. There are uh, uh, flyers outside. I encourage you all to take one. Uh, the first summit was hosted at Morehouse College by John Wilson and Bryant Marks. Uh, uh, later this week, we will be joining our brothers in Kosbach and Jackson, Mississippi. Um, but the point here is that in each of these cities, what we're doing is those two things that I mentioned, highlighting the importance of having the conversation, reminding people that there are individuals and systems that are connected to this work, that are conspiring for the success of our kids, and then ensuring that when they walk out of that space, there's somebody that they can go to. So they don't just sit in a room and get excited, but then get defeated when they walk out and are reminded that there are a whole lot of challenges that they need to endure. Specifically, as it relates to boys and men of color, my brother's keeper provides us with an opportunity to be reminded again that a lot of this work is already happening in our communities. There are lots of schools that don't get any of the attention that they deserve for celebrating and supporting our young men and boys. That's why this partnership with Kohlsbach is really important. To acknowledge to the point that I think Sean made, we aren't waiting for anything to happen. This is about celebrating what's working and finding ways to double down and do more where we know things aren't working. Um, 
uh, again, thinking about um, moving into 20 years, um, there are at least three things that I think about that we need to uh, celebrate in this space, sort of um, to the elders who are in here thinking, you know, what have we gained in the last 20 years? One, there's been a considerable amount of progress made in reframing the narrative. Uh, less than 10 years ago, when I was an undergraduate student at Columbia, I had to defend my desire to write a thesis about reimagining black male identity. The first question was, what about the women? Right Now we are in spaces where we acknowledge that there is power and precision. And we will look at most of the quality of life indicators across the spectrum. Boys and men of color are at the lowest rungs of those, those ladders. Now again, this isn't a conversation about being exclusive. It's also not a conversation about investing in our boys so that our women have somebody to marry. We also have to acknowledge that diversity with a capital D exists within our community as well. But it's about responding to the specific opportunities we have to meet our boys where they are and to support them as they grow. The second thing is about acknowledging that a lot of these assets already exist in our community. I think that this is appropriate as we have this conversation today in a year where there were so many other seminal things that have happened over the course of our history. When we think about Freedom Summer, a lot of the people that led those movements were younger than any of us in this room, right? Those assets still exist. Those experiences still exist. It's about us doing a better job of stepping out of our silos and doing the uncomfortable thing and talking to one another. The third thing we need to do is focus on things that we know that work. So I'm going to, before I take my seat, highlight six things that have been uh, uh, helpful in shaping the work of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans. The first is acknowledging that if we keep having these conversations about what happens to our babies in kindergarten, that we should give this up. As Leah said, and what most of us know, learning starts at birth and the preparation for learning starts well before birth. We have to start there, spend more time with our babies, with our mothers and our fathers before our children are ever breathe the first air, right? And if we start there, we can save money and resources we spend now trying to help them catch up. The second thing is literacy, right? You guys all know the data around third grade, eighth grade reading levels. That's not even the concern at this point. What I want us to focus on is the fact that we know adults who are functionally illiterate. We ask ourselves why our babies can't read. It's because the adults around them aren't reading. And then we don't want to have those conversations. So I was at the Hampton's Ministers Conference. Some of you have heard me tell this story before. But there was a minister who stood up and asked me a question about what we were doing for literacy. Because his grown son, who works in a hospital, may kill himself consuming something that will cause him harm because he cannot read the label. And when I asked the man how often he had talked about it in the pulpit, he said to me, zero. We, as a community, have to get beyond not talking about the things that make us feel ashamed or uncomfortable. The third thing is, again, acknowledging this is an all-hands-on-deck enterprise, right? We should have conversations about acknowledging that educators do God's work. And far too often, it's the case that we aren't talking to our kids about whether or not they've considered being an educator, or acknowledging that many of us are educators formally or informally. Now, to be clear, people often say teaching isn't rocket science. They're right. It's a lot harder. <laughs> teaching isn't for everybody. So if you can't teach, then mentor. Find some way, individually or collectively, to put your bodies on your kids and say to them, as A.C. Hillier said, I see the genius in you. I'm going to meet you with love and support you as you grow. The fourth thing we focus on is increasing the number of black folks that have two-year, four-year degrees, credentials, and certificates. I am not one of those people that believes that college is not for everybody. You graduate from college, and then you tell me it's not for you, right? Think about it. It's often college-educated people that say that. We got to acknowledge our own privilege, right? It's just not fair for us to say, this is OK for you. It's not OK for you. Support all of them, and then let them make the decision at the point in time at which it's appropriate. The last thing we focus on, and this one is, I think, most important because it frames everything. And Susan, I'm going to look at you as I start this. But it's reframing the narrative. It is literally changing the way that we talk about and allow people to perceive us. We have to start telling the truth, the whole truth. So before I take my seat, I know I'm a Baptist preacher. I said I'm going to take my seat at least twice. I want to give you eight myths that we need to bust, right? And raise your hand if you've heard somebody in the last month say there are more black men in prison than in college. It is factually inaccurate. The next time they say it or tweet it, hashtag receipts. Remind them that as Ivory Tolson has identified, there are 600,000 more black men on college campuses around this country. The footnote is that we are still overrepresented in the prison system. But we can't allow people to tell a lie that suggests that if you were an educator, primarily a white woman, you can take yourself off the hook. You don't have to do the work of reaching that young boy where he is because he's going to end up dead or in jail. It's just not true. And for those of you who have been in classrooms, you have seen how myths like that impact us. The second myth that we need to bust is that less than 50% of us are graduating from high school. Here's the note. If you don't know how a statistic was derived, you should not use it. According to a 2013 Education Week study, about 62% of African Americans complete high school. This is compared to 80% of white students, an increase of 30% in narrowing the gap. Here's the thing that I like more of us to talk about. 
In uh, 2009, uh, 10 of the na uh, 2009 to 2010, the national graduation rate for black male students was 52%. Um, the graduation for white students was 72%. That was the first year that more than half of the nation's black male uh, in the ninth grade graduated with, more, with a regular four-year diploma. And we still are recycling that old statistic. The next one, black males don't go to college. I didn't show y'all that that's, that's not true, right? Each of you know black men who are in college in spite of all of the challenges that we receive. So here's a stat that I'd like you all to share. From 1976 to 2010, the percentage of black students enrolled in college increased from 9% to 14%. Now here's the kicker. During that same period, the percentage of white students decreased from 83% but 61%. Why are we the only ones experiencing a crisis? Follow the data. The next one, African-American student athletes graduate at higher rates than their non-athletic black peers. It's not true. NCAA Division I college sports athletes graduate at a rate of 50.2% compared to 55.5% of their non-athletic peers. We gotta start telling the truth. African-American male students have the same opportunities as their peer. What we know and what the Department of Education and the Department of Justice have shown in the recent release CRDC Civil Rights Data Study is that black males are disproportionately impacted in significant and severe ways. We are policed, we are pushed out, we are expelled, we are surveilled. We are denied almost every opportunity we can to access the skills that we need in order to be successful. And in spite of that, we still succeed with a whole lot of grace. The next thing, African-American males are underachievers. There's been black men before you all day that have bust that myth wide open, right? We can go down to Atlanta and find a whole campus of them, right? We just gotta start telling the truth. The last one, black men don't go into service-oriented position, uh, positions or fields. And this is one that I personally grapple with, right? I'm looking at a couple of my classmates who know that when we at Columbia started talking about going into education, I always say, if I could paint, I would paint that moment when all of the feelings flushed out of their faces and they tried to find the words to say, but why? Right? Because that's not the message that we give to our kids. Right? We don't say to them that no matter what you do, you're obligated to live your life in service to somebody else. That the greatest thing you can do is to support the development of somebody else who looks like you, who came from the same community that you did, who struggles with the same things that you are still struggling with to this day. And we've got to get out of our way. We have to acknowledge that for black men, education is one of the top three professions that they choose if they graduate from college. Now, the opportunity for us is to make sure that more of them graduate from high school prepared to go into and get through college. And that starts with seeing them. Moving past all this data, moving past all of the stories that people will have you believing about us, and seeing us for the complicated, graceful, God-fearing people that we are. Toni Morrison said it best in Sula. She called black men the envy of the world. We need to recognize it and celebrate it. Thank you.